Well, thank you, Sandy, for the outstanding job that you continue to do leading our agricultural programs here at the University of Mount Olive. Secretary Perdue, you can let those in Washington know that not only do we have an outstanding agricultural program, but we're making a great impact on employment, the employment numbers as well, because our agricultural graduates have a 100% placement rate in their chosen agricultural fields. But even more important is that 83% of those graduates have chosen to work right here in Eastern North Carolina. In addition to our outstanding farmers who are in the audience here, we have a number of special guests that are joining us today. First, let me introduce the man who is doing a great job at the State House as an outstanding advocate for not just agriculture in Eastern North Carolina, but across our great state, the Senior Agricultural Chair, Representative Jimmy Dixon. Would you stand? We also have with us Agricultural Chair Representative William Brits Brisson of Bladen County. Would you stand? In addition, Representative Larry Strickland, Agriculture Chair, is with us as well of Johnston County. And Mrs. Branberry of Senator Byrd's office, would you stand, please? And former Senator and House of Representatives member, UMO supporter, and the namesake of the facility that we're in, the Murphy Center, the Honorable Mr. Wall Wendell Murphy. Would you stand, Mr. Murphy? Also, Mr. Donnie Lassiter, member of the Board of Trustees at UMO and benefactor of the Donnie and Linda Lassiter Agricultural Campus. Would you stand, please? <laughs> Stephanie and Barbara Cornegie, representing the family for the George R. Cornegie Jr. Student Farm. <laughs> Mr. Joe Scott, the mayor of Mount Olive. And my boss, Mr. Earl Worley, Jr., Chairman of the Board of Trustees at University of Mount Olive. Well, I don't want to spend too much more time because we want to get this, this show on the road. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Larry Wooten to introduce our uh, program this morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Poole. It's certainly my pleasure. And wow, what a crowd of good North Carolinians, ag leaders, farmers from across this great state of ours. I told the secretary just a minute ago that certainly your presence here today was an indication of the ag economy, both good and not so good in North Carolina. For, for all of you to be in attendance here today, I know you want to ask the secretary some questions, and so we'll get right into that. The commissioner I know is on his way here. Uh, it's going to be with us this afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, we're indeed honored here in North Carolina this afternoon to have this town hall meeting, not only today, but, but the Secretary of Agriculture of the United States has been in North Carolina on multiple occasions the last year during disasters, uh, other town hall meetings, and certainly we're honored that the Secretary is here with us. Uh, all of you know that Secretary Perdue uh, is a native of Georgia. He was born on a family farm in Barnett, Bonaire, Georgia. He grew up on a dairy and diversified row crop farm in rural Georgia. He's a farmer. He's an agribusinessman. He's a veterinarian. He had a veterinary practice here in North Carolina, so he knows this state. Uh, a state legislature, a state legislator. He was two times a governor of the state of Georgia, a great state with a great agricultural heritage. Uh, this secretary of agriculture, and I've had the opportunity to work with several, but we've never had a secretary, I don't believe, more qualified that not only can he talk the walk, he has walked the walk for agriculture in this country. All of you know that Secretary Perdue was the 31st United States Secretary of Agriculture. As Secretary, 
I know and I've seen that Secretary Purdue believes and he's guided in four ways. Number one, he, wants, he believes that agriculture and agribusiness ought to create jobs. He believes in that. Number two, he believes that his agency, the USDA, and all the services they provide ought to be customer service, a customer friendly agency every day for American taxpayers and certainly all of, all of the clients. And thirdly, he knows that USDA is responsible for a safe and secure food supply. He also knows that food security, and we here in North Carolina know how important our military is in terms of national security, but we also know that food security is an important part, uh, important part of our national security. And fourth, Secretary Purdue knows the land. He believes that agriculture's bounty comes directly from the land. Secretary Purdue is, as I said, is from Georgia. He's married, he's been married to Mary Ruff Purdue for 45 years. They have four adult children and 14 grandchildren. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a warm North Carolina welcome to our Secretary of Agriculture for the United States, Secretary Sonny Purdue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Larry, after that introduction, I think we just ought to give the invitation. And, uh, but uh, good afternoon, everyone. This, uh, Larry said, this is an indication of uh, North Carolina agriculture. I said, it looks pretty strong to me. But uh, it is good to be here with you. We've had a couple other stops uh, earlier today, and I'm glad to be back in North Carolina. Glad to be here at a Institutional Higher Learning, uh, President Poole, Dr. Maddox, thank you all for hosting us and y'all have drawn a real crowd. So I look forward, I love to engage. We get out of DC as often as we can in order to uh, learn some stuff and learn what I need to know rather than what I know up there. But uh, it's uh, important to engage with the people that you're trying to serve and our producers have had a pretty tough year in 2018. Uh, irrespective of the hurricane, but even there with other issues, it's been, been kind of tough. So we want to talk about those things on your mind today, hear questions and uh, uh, try to find some answers or mostly uh, go back and do my homework about what we ought to be focusing on. But uh, it's a real delight to be here in Mount Olive and uh, to see uh, the agricultural program. I want to thank you gentlemen for uh, your help and your contributions to uh, developing this program here at uh, the University of Mount Olive and the agricultural program. It's good to hear uh, the employment. Uh, the fact is we need more of them. You know, those, uh, those students in agriculture, we've got a growing uh, high-tech industry in agriculture that's gonna take more and more of these bright young people with an aspirate uh, career in uh, growing food and fiber and fuel for the world. So uh, I'm an optimist about that and uh, while we've got some tough times, you farmers have known there have been tough times before. And what President Trump knows is you're some of the most resilient Americans he's ever seen. I tell crowds that he, uh, he has an infinite ability to identify uh, with farmers. Being born in New York City, raised in New York City in the real, real estate market there, he has an uncanny ability to, to really have an affinity and affection for the United States farmer and rancher. I think it's because he believes that you all embody the American spirit. What he was calling about last Tuesday night, the greatness of America. And uh, he believes that much of that is lies within our agricultural community, risk takers, hard workers, uh, value people, the law of the land. You can't cheat on it. And he knows that. And he, uh, he has a real heart for you. Uh, he, uh, he's pretty forceful in his opinions, as you well know. But the only thing he's told me is, Sonny, you take care of our farmers. And I know he wants us to do that. So we want to learn how better how to do that today over the things that are on your mind. This is not a speech that I'm going to give, but it's a listening session where I can hear from you. We can discuss. I'll be happy to answer any questions the best I can, address anything on your mind. But uh, please speak up and uh, let's have a dynamic discussion today. And uh, let's welcome Secretary Commissioner Troxler, who just came, came in too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So uh, I did say earlier at, over the Warren Farm that uh, we have one of your own in the, is my chief of staff, Ray Starling here from uh, Sampson County, has been a great help to me. He had been in the White House. I, I actually stole him from the president. So uh, to bring him over and to be uh, USDA, been a great fit there. He's an authentic agriculturalist from an agricultural family. And uh, y'all can tell that, uh, y'all can tell Ray and I both what we've been stepping in, okay? So thank you. Is my mic is my mic on? Can you? Yeah, good, John. Thank you. Well, I know uh, I'm certainly you didn't come here to listen to me, uh, and uh, the secretary is uh, going to be here. I've had a lot of you come up and say you've got something, a question, something's on your mind. Let's take the first question or comment. Who'd like the first question or comment for the secretary? Rich Bonanno. Thanks, Larry. There's a there's a microphone that bring it up. They're bringing mic. The runners are bringing microphones, so speak into the mic. Thanks, uh, President Wooten. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Secretary. Uh, just the thought. I, I work for NC State University. Uh, we, we talk a lot about the future of agriculture. We talk about how the, we're going to have a need for more food, uh, more investment in research and education. But a couple of things that have been alluded to today are the needs for more people to graduate from colleges and universities uh, in agriculture. I believe your agency estimated that we're going to have a need for 57,900 graduates each year for the jobs nationally uh, in agriculture. That's not just farmers, that's people working in industry, working uh, as from high, high school ag teachers, uh, working for uh, uh, the universities, working for uh, your agency, working for state departments of agriculture, and so forth. Currently, we're graduating 35,400. So we're short about 22,500. And even with your own agency, NRCS, we talk about uh, hiring people outside of agriculture just because we don't have enough people. Uh, what are your thoughts about how to change that, how we can change maybe the, how USDA or the country promotes agriculture, how we can get more people interested in becoming students and having a future in the agriculture industry broadly? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's a good question and uh, obviously a needful question about how we engage students. I think in this country we're probably still uh, maybe suffering from a little bit of stigma of agriculture because many people don't know the complexity of all it takes to be in agriculture and the wide breadth of the supply chain from the fields to the tables at uh, all of agriculture, from research and development, from uh, logistics, from all the things, processing. We were just over at Butterball and uh, uh, amazing facility there to see all they do and the percentage of turkeys that uh, the supply in the U.S. It, it is a broad career with many, many choices. And for young people who are looking for a career, as you heard earlier, 100% uh, graduate, 100% employment rate. Uh, there are jobs out there in agriculture, and it's not uh, it's not just in the fields or, or whatever. It's uh, for those who can do that, we're going to need farmers. You, you know the demographics uh, better than I do. We have an aging population there. That's why at USDA we're trying to do programs to help incentivize and help financially young and beginning and, dis, uh, uh, and farmers that have been disadvantaged in that way to come into that. What we're seeing nationwide from the growing perspective is that many of the young people, millennials if you will, are looking at smaller plots of land find that they don't have to start with a thousand acres, but they can start in smaller areas and do uh, specialty crops and grow. And we've seen some very successful operations across the land. But we need, we need ag communicators. I, I tell young people, and I love, I'm optimistic about the future because when I see these FFA kids and, and the young farmer group that we just had today, they're passionate and we need to engage them. One of the things that we probably at USDA have not done as good a job as we could is reaching out in a diversity way all across the land in our land grant universities that have a heart for kids from rural areas. I find many times they're the ones that really have a heart and passion for the land and to, uh, to go into those kind of careers. So we want to see those. We want to do a better job there. There's a pathway program there uh, for young people who may be aspiring. Look at USA Jobs and uh, look at all the variety of jobs in USDA. 
and uh, if you want a corporate career, if you want a, a government career, but uh, there are also other many other ways. So people is uh, in any organization, large and small, it's the real key. We see a lot of technological growth in precision agriculture, uh, GPS technology. That's why rural broadband is so important. So it's really important to engage young people. We need young people who want to communicate agriculture. I talk about trying to encourage young people to go into ag communications because no longer can we farmers sit behind the farm gate and just say, I just grow it and y'all do whatever you want to with it. We've got to, people need to know how we grow it, what we put in it, what we don't, how we're doing it, and we have nothing to be ashamed about in the farming community. We ought to be very proud of having the, the best, safest, most affordable food supply, most wholesome in the world by far. So uh, we need to communicate that message because, as you know, there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a minority, a small minority of people who would love to see animal agriculture done away with, and uh, I don't, uh, we, we need to, we need to fight back with facts, and hopefully we can educate young people here at places like UMO to tell the true facts and true story and invite people on our farm so they can see what we're doing. Mr. Secretary, here in North Carolina, as across the country, we were really happy that the uh, farm bill was passed, and uh, some, someone asked me a question, a question about has the government shut down, impacted in a negative way, the implementation of the farm bill from your agency, and what would be the prospects of, a, of another shutdown should it, should it happen on farm bill implementation? Uh, most people in here know legislation is passed uh, and it's kind of broad like a six lane road and we have to kind of narrow down the rules and regulations with the uh, regulations and implementation rules there so the farmers can have exact uh, um, directions of how the farm bill is to be utilized. And that's what we're doing. We had a skeleton crew, Larry, during the shutdown that I char charged to continue to work on the implementation rules. We're going to do those as quickly as possible. Uh, there's no doubt that the delay, the 35-day 35 35 shutdown will delay some, but I don't expect it to be a month behind, and we're working as fast and as quickly as we can in order to get up that. I'm not, I'm not even willing to consider your second question about another shutdown. Let's, let's, let's hope that let's hope we're smarter. Let's hope we're all smarter than that. Question from the audience or a comment from the audience. Who's got one? Yeah, Dan Weatherington. He's a small grain growers. You know, a lot of our farmers in North Carolina are in some financial difficulties. We've had some bankruptcy sales. Farm Credit's doing a great job in supporting them and working with them on our loans. I'm hearing a lot of private banks here in the state are pulling away from agricultural loans. What could you say to these private banks to help us get through these tough times on behalf of USDA? Well, again, I think you mentioned the farm credit system. We've got a, a healthy farm credit system that uh, is in there year in and year out, and uh, I think uh, they're to be relied on. You've got a lot of good community banks that hang in there. They've got uh, depositors' money they have to protect and make good business decisions. I would uh, tell them to look at the safety net, look at uh, hopefully the disaster program that we'll be announcing very soon, as soon as Congress is able to pass that, uh, uh, but what happened in 2018 regarding Hurricane Florence here, Michael in Georgia and Florida and other places there, to look at those kind of things, look at crop insurance, do a good operating plan. Uh, it's no doubt that uh, prices are challenging right now. Uh, but uh, I would hope that our community banks that want to serve their customers, many of whom are farmers uh, year in and year out, will continue to hang there with them. Uh, obviously, uh, well, I can't tell them how to underwrite their loans, but I just would ask for their, uh, uh, their compassion to know the people, the character. Most of these country community banks, farm banks, are, are more able to lend on uh, the, uh, the, the, the basic C's of what banking used to be. I think uh, re some relaxation on the Dodd-Frank rules that Congress did this last year uh, will help them. There were some rules that kind of tied their hands uh, in the past years. I think some of that's been relaxed. So I just ask them to, uh, to do their best to serve the people that have been there with them and got them where they are. And hopefully we can have our operators, our farmers, uh, uh, secure their financing for this uh, 2019 crop. 
Next question. Who's got a question? Another comment or question to the secretary? Yes. Young uh, lady, lady standing right there. Hi, I'm Sarah Julia Selden. I'm a uh, first generation farmer in Western North Carolina. I was excited to see that in the new farm bill, uh, farmers are supposed to be involved in the process of reviewing 2501 grants to disadvantaged farmers. How are you reaching out to farmers to include them in that process? And we have a, a really a whole office called the Office of uh, Partnerships and Public Outreach there to do exactly that. And uh, it's led by Mike Beatty, who engages both the young and beginning farmers and other farmers to do those kind of grants as we go, go forward. And that's uh, where we call feedback. Mostly the feedback loop is uh, typically best uh, achieved through the website. And uh, there's even a USDA.gov uh, slash tell Sunny on there. If you don't find what you're looking for, then uh, uh, make sure we, uh, we respond to those. And we're trying to have a real responsive uh, uh, USDA. And my goal is to, uh, to have the most efficient, most effective, the most customer focused agency in the federal government. And we really mean that. We're getting good anecdotal stories across the country over cultural changes. Our uh, state directors for FSA and NRCS and rural development are here today. I want them to hear exactly what I hear as we're out about. But if we're not serving you, if you don't know the information, then uh, uh, email in and uh, uh, get on the website and look and see if you don't find what you want. We are also in the process of improving uh, contact outreach. We're trying to do a, a common contact. I imagine you, like I, have tried to reach a federal office before, and you get in this circular loop of maze, and you never get where you're going. How frustrating is that? We're trying to have a customer contact center where you get a, a live answer. They direct you. If they can't answer you, they direct you with a good database to the live person that can help you so that people can get real answers on the phone and do that. So if you don't find what you see there, then tell Sonny. I think on the website about 2501 or the photo program, just okay. so you know. All right. Well, that's why I'm here. Next, next question. Yes, sir. Young man standing up I, over here. I think, here. again, in all fairness, we talked about farm bill implementation. The changes that you've mentioned in 2501 probably have ne not been uh, implemented in this uh, 18 farm bill yet. It's Brent Leggett from Nash County. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Um, I'd like to just pass along a message. Mr. Secretary, um, I have a son that's 12 years old, and he texts every day after school, what are we doing on the farm? I, did, I texted him back today, told him I was at a meeting listening to you speak, and he had a comment that he asked, could I re please relay to you? And his comment was, I'm going to read it just like he, he texted to me. It says, tell him to tell Trump to make a deal with China. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, So, out, of the, out of the mouths of babes, out of the mouths of babes, isn't it? I mean, this is a 12-year-old boy who's in the sixth grade. All he wants to do is farm. We raise tobacco, sweet potatoes, cotton, and soybeans and peanuts on our farm. The tobacco industry is in a really, really dismay right now with all the tariffs we're faced on. Eastern North Carolina is tobacco land. That's what, that's what our crops are. It's where we're located at. But this is a 12-year-old son that hears his mom and dad talk about all the issues we're facing and um, I just thought it was a very interesting text in his response. And I just want to relay that to you that in North Carolina, you know, we're really struggling as the administration works through these tariff issues. And I know that's a little political, but it's a really big issue for many of us in this room. No, it's not political. It's, it's real. And I'd love to engage your son. And uh, I'd, have a tech, I'd love to have a text conversation with him. I'll give him, give him my text number as well if he he'd love to text. Uh, here's what I would tell him. I don't know if he plays sports or not, but say he had, you went and bought him a $75 glove and a $300 bat for sports, and he took it to school, and somebody stole it. And uh, that's exactly what China's been doing in our intellectual technology for years. That's what they built their economy on, and President Trump has thrown the flag on it and not going to let them go do it any longer. He's in it for the long game just like farmers are. He's trying to make sure your 12-year-old son can have a level, even playing field with the people internationally. That's what his purpose is. And I hope that we can sustain our farming operations so we can reap the benefits of it. 
but as we go into 19, it's many concerns about just how detrimental the tariffs are going to be to eastern North Carolina. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Brent. Who else has got a question out here? Yes, uh, John Langdon, Johnston County. Larry, Sonny, John Langdon from Johnston County. <clears throat> Welcome. I got uh, sort of a two-part question. I wear a couple of hats. I'm um, chairman of the uh, North Carolina Soil and Water Commission, and I'm a district supervisor in our local district. And um, we've had quite a bit of storm damage over the se last several years in, in North Carolina, and, and a lot of uh, um, government money coming in uh, for recovery. But the complaints I hear uh, through FSA office, through the local soil and water office, is the bottleneck is through NRCS. The, 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 the lack of training, the lack of staffing. They have a great, wonderful bunch of programs that are really probably better than we've ever had. And NRCS has uh, deep pockets. Problem is they, they don't have the people on the ground with the experience to open the gate to let it through. So FSA is tied up. Soil and water's tied up, and it looks to the general public in the county and the state that though the FSA and soil and water maybe is dragging their feet, but it's really the lack of NRCS's ability to be able to uh, get the money where it belongs when it needs to get there. D during these um, uh, storm events, when the people are really in dire need and you got state money, you got federal money to come in to help local people, and it, it becomes a Quite a, quite a situation. I didn't know if you'd like to speak about that. Now, I can't speak about it, but I'd love if you give me some specific uh, illustrations and examples. I'd love to talk to Tim Beard here in North Carolina about it and uh, uh, see what we can do about that. But uh, uh, it's generally, uh, you don't find many federal offices that don't say they need more people, but uh, I'd love to have uh, specific examples. If you'll provide that to me today before we leave, then uh, we'll be happy to look into that. As you mentioned, Storm damage has come, and you've had tough times here uh, for a couple of years in North Carolina, and sometimes you get overwhelmed in that regard, not making excuses, but if storms come, then the NRCS should be on the ground helping people to restore those streams and others, but uh, we can't do it all at one time, as you know, but uh, if there are specific issues, I'd love to know about them so we can address them. Yeah, and we work well with Tim. I think Tim's in the room, and we've had lots of conversations about this for the last three or four years, actually. But the um, fact of the matter is, is we, we've lost a lot of institutional knowledge due through uh, retirement uh, and, and hiring maybe more educated but less um, experienced <coughs> employees to, to fill those gaps. Um, thank, thank you a lot. Secretary, I've got some other folks more. I, I got one more thing, okay. if I may. One As more. a farmer, I'm married to a veterinarian, uh, an Auburn graduate. And uh, we are hog farmers, cattle farmers, corn and grain. And in North Carolina, a lot of poultry, as is well in Georgia, as you well know. And um, the hog business is, and the poultry business has allowed the cattle business to thrive in eastern North Carolina. And I, I enjoyed you being down in New Orleans with NCBA a couple of weeks ago and appreciate the thoughts you had to say there. But with that being said, a lot of people don't realize that the southeastern United States have 28 percent of the nation's cattle the problem is with the hours of service we got going on with the trucking to get these cattle out of here to the feed yards to the to, to the midwest or, or west or in the in the iowa areas is going to be a challenge so looking forward in, in the, i guess the next 50 or 100 years it would be awful nice if we could think about some some feeding areas in the southeast and some processing and hooks to hang these carcasses on to process this that a lot of these cattle are coming off of these poultry farms, the, the swine farms, and to be able to sustain our agricultural um, livestock industry in the future in the southeast. That's, thank, I just want to make John. a comment. Thank you. So you have a comment on that, Mr. Secretary. Next question. Who's got a question? Uh, this, this gentleman right here has got a he's got his hand up for a microphone. Student at A&T State University. Deshaun Blanding, North Carolina A&T State University. Um, I hail from a rural community in South Carolina. And I know you all just conducted your interagency task force on rural prosperity and agricultural prosperity. And from that, you have five action items that were identified. What are those next steps you're going to take to make sure we have rural prosperity for our farmers? Yes, but for the communities as a whole. 
Well, again, rural development is a big part of that. I think one of the things we found out is that uh, uh, broadband connectivity is really important across to allow across rural areas to allow our rural areas to uh, get into the 21st century, almost like electrification was in the 1930s. It's one of the focuses that we're doing. But our rural development directors here as well, obviously they deal with uh, water, uh, wastewater issues for rural communities, uh, broadband uh, connectivity that way, and community facilities, both health and uh, educational facilities in there. So uh, we're partnering with other federal agencies to, to get those things done. Uh, rural prosperity is not a magic bullet. There's not one single answer. It takes both local effort and the state and community and federal effort to do that. So we look to partner with uh, with all these folks to uh, uh, to do a better job to really achieve rural prosperity. I think those action items that we continue to move along uh, in actionable ways. Next next question. Someone, yes, uh, young. Hey, how are you? I'm Mackenzie Henson from the Make a Difference Food Pantry, and I have a quick question for you. As the owner of a food pantry, part of my mission is to provide nutritious food for my clients as the obesity rate continues to rise in our country because junk food is cheaper than healthier food. I ask the question, how can we make it easier and less expensive for local farmers to participate in the local farm-to-table school programs where their produce serve serves their local schools and provides profitable and provides profitable income for them and benefits local schools and students there are provisions in the farm bill that uh, had been in there since 14 and are actually enhanced in the 2018 farm bill that allow uh, local farmers at uh, not only farm markets but also the uh, to the to the school er issues and buying local so we hope we can continue to perpetuate that and have a healthier, safely, local grown, locally grown food uh, for the future. That is important. But Mr. Secretary, uh, we, we all know that uh, the number one and two trading partners for North Carolina Ag is Mexico and Canada. And this new, new Uzmeca, new, new NAFTA, I call it, is, uh, is going before the Congress. What can these people do? Uh, to help us get that through, and what would be the result if it doesn't pass the Congress and this this were not does not not pass? We don't just go back to the NAFTA we we know. That's right, Larry. The um, the USMCA agreement has been negotiated over a while. Uh, you may remember that we all kind of feared when President Trump threatened to uh, withdraw from NAFTA. Right. Uh, Mexico and Canada had been uh, in the top three of our export destinations for a long time and developed good markets there in both uh, plants uh, and uh, meat and uh, we need to preserve those markets. I think the USMCA has done that. I think it's improved. Typically what we heard when we were threatened to withdraw was first of all do no harm to agriculture. Not only has President Trump done that, I think he's improved the deal with dairy access in, in Canada uh, new modern uh, sanitary, phytosanitary agreements, uh, accepting technological, as well as dealing with other parts of the American economy, including manufacturing. So uh, we believe it's a better deal. Congress obviously has to ratify it. I certainly hope that most people will look at it on its face as a trade agreement and vote on that, not trying to play politics like we're prone to do right now and just not give President Trump a win on anything. This is truly for America, so I hope Congress will look at it and, uh, you know, it does matter what constituents uh, 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 say and write to their members of Congress. And if, it, if people are compelled to do that, then I would encourage them to, uh, uh, to look at the agreement. And if they like it, then uh, uh, tell the congressman uh, what they like or don't like about it and, and encourage them to vote uh, uh, what, which way they want to, want to do that, to advocate for. But I think it's a good agreement. I think you're going to have somebody in Congress say, well, you should have got this, you ought to got that. And you, oh, you know, you can always do better. There's, ne there's never been a perfect trade agreement. Right. And ladies and gentlemen, I can't emphasize enough this trade agreement, this United States, Mexico, Canada trade agreement is critical for North Carolina and North Carolina agriculture. It is just critical. And certainly we're working at Farm Bureau and other farm groups with our congressional delegation, but we must get this across the finish line. Kendall Hill, you got a question? 
Let, let him get a microphone to you, Kendall. Yes, sir. My name is Kendall Hill. Uh, my family is a long time produce grower in North Carolina. My question is, how are we going to keep producing vegetables, fruits and vegetables in this country when the trend is for the prices to keep decreasing and getting lower and all of our expenses are going higher? Uh, the chains have come in with these bidding processes that are, in my estimation, or unfair trade practices, the way they are doing it. They make, they don't, they wind up telling you what you're going to sell for. The growers and shippers get intimidated because they don't think they'll be able to sell their product. And so the last, for this article in the American vegetable growers where the fruit and vegetable industry, the prices have gone down 37% and since about 205, 208, up to 16. How are we going to reverse this trend? Because everything we buy, everything we do, every worker we hire, every corner we turn, our expenses are going up and our product is getting a less price every day. We need some help from the government because the farmer cannot buy we cannot compete against Amazon who owns Whole Food and these big chains that are, you know, all at Walmart. We, we can't compete against them without some kind of help from somebody. Thank you. Well, I think your, your industry, your specific specialty crops were probably the one that uh, didn't fare as well in the USMCA. Uh, U.S. Trade Representative Ambassador Lighthizer is still working on agreements with Mexico, uh, potentially on uh, uh, countervailing duties and uh, anti-dumping uh, litigation in that way. Uh, but the challenge is obviously, and uh, a lot of things, frankly, in the run-up in prices in farming from in the grain industry from 2008 to 2013, there are a lot of things that have lost value since that time. But uh, it's challenging out there. And uh, when people are no longer able to grow it profitably, it won't be grown. and. Uh, and the, these chains and others are going to have to find it, and they're going to have to pay up to get it. So it's the way the economy works. Got a, got a, got a, got a question back here in the back. Charles Rooks from Rooks Farm Service. Uh, Secretary Perdue, one of the main questions I have is about the, um, the disaster support, well, the support we've got on tariffs. But since we're all in a, in a do, in an area of southeast North Carolina, probably uh, South Carolina and Georgia, we had no, no crop. In other words, so the tariff is like $1.65 a bushel if you have bushels. But um, we've been told that it's basically going to be on our production. Um, the rest of the country is getting the support of $1.65 a bushel on their normal production. So my question is, and I've asked at our local FSA offices and haven't been able to get the answer, is it, well, they said, well, that's how it's set up. But in a disaster area, it would be great if we could um, have it set up based on the proven yield, insurance yields. Um, and the rest of the country is getting the, the support on tariffs. But if we're in a disaster area and we've got a third of a crop, we don't have any bushels or uh, subsidy. Uh, that's Thank where you. our farms, other safety net programs come in with insurance and a disaster program that hopefully Congress will pass very soon. The premise is, and, and we talked a lot about this, but the premise is uh, these were trade uh, mitigation efforts. If you did not have a crop, you didn't really have any trade damage there because you wouldn't have had any beans to sell uh, regardless in that way. It's based on production because it was based on trade mitigation damage and uh, how much you were damaged by uh, not being able to sell your crop, export your crop that way. So it's not just other parts of the country. It's parts of Georgia, South Carolina that didn't have that flooding. So it's not regional based. It's uh, people that produced a crop and proved their yield uh, are benefiting from that. Those that had a disaster uh, have to uh, rely on crop insurance, the safety net that's there, as well as uh, other, uh, other disaster programs that are hopefully coming their way. I know Commissioner Troxler in the, in the Georgia General or the North Carolina General Assembly passed uh, some help there. I think checks are coming out that way. And uh, Congressman Rouser said he hopes within the two or three weeks they'll have the federal disaster program out. That's where we can address those issues. But it, it's two separate programs. The market facilitation 
program was based on trade mitigation damage, and uh, I don't see any other way to do that. And ladies and gentlemen, we have three members of, I know, see three members of our North Carolina General Assembly, uh, along with the work of the Commissioner of Agriculture and his staff. In all my years, I've never seen as much work done in a little while to get uh, part of that $240 million out. And I think the members of the legislature, as well as the commissioner and his team, need a round of applause. And let's thank them for that. The, uh, and, the, and the commissioner is here. We're not going to end this without giving Commissioner Trox or stand. He, was, he got tied up in traffic, but I'm certainly not going to conclude this a little later without him. Who's got a, somebody else had? Yes, man in the, uh, Russell, Russell Hedrick from Catawba County. Secretary Perdue, thank you for your time, first of all. Uh, one of the questions I have is being a part of the North Carolina Farm Bureau, Young Farmer and Ranchers, I hear a lot of, of issues that we're having, and one of them is um, looking at policy reform as far as our H-2A program and migrancy workers coming in. Uh, we grow a lot of great crops in this state, but it does take people to get them out of the field and to the market. Um, has your office seen anything where maybe we're going to start seeing both sides of the aisle come out of the trenches and actually see some reform that's going to help farmers here in North Carolina? It's a great question. I told a group earlier today there are three issues I hear repetitively across the country in east, west, north, and south. First is trade, second is labor, and third is regulation. And uh, the labor issue is uh, certainly uh, has been very onerous regarding H-2A. Uh, we're trying to make some regulatory changes in there, working with the Department of Labor. Uh, we're trying to create a portal at USDA to almost be a turbo tax type model where the, uh, the farmer who needs the labor would apply through there. We'd make sure all the I's are dotted, T's are crossed, and send it to the other three agencies that have statutory authority over the uh, Department of Labor, Homeland Security, and, and State Department in order to get uh, things done. This uh, regulation change will stop all this silly advertising in newspapers everywhere and uh, stop that. We are also working hard. Senator Tillis here and your delegation is working hard on this adverse wage rate to freeze it until we can get better data on that as well. So there are some minor changes, but the real major change needs to come in any kind of immigration bill. Chairman Goodlatte of the Judiciary had a good bill last year and we just couldn't get uh, a vote on it. The uh, Western growers uh, uh, wouldn't agree to that, and they stopped some of the California delegation from bringing it up, but uh, it would have been helpful. And, uh, but it's gonna take probably a comprehensive, uh, we're hoping if there's a comprehensive immigration bill dealing with border security or other things, then we can get a, uh, an ag, a, a legal guest worker ag program in there as well. That's what our, we're hoping, and we're, we're queued up to do that. We've had a lady that I, I took from Farm Bureau when we first came in there, uh, a young lawyer from Nebraska that's been working on that pretty much 90% of her time and in, in working with that. But we, uh, we understand the need, the seasonality issue for dairy or other uh, livestock growers is not just uh, during harvest time or planting time. So uh, it's a big deal that we're trying to work on. Uh, right now, uh, we, Chairman Goodlatte retired. We don't, we don't have a real champion out there pushing something right now, but uh, we're working uh, with Congress to get something done. Mr. Secretary, I do know that you've got a good hand in Christy. I can't think of her last name now, Linda, but Christy from, Bo Christy Boswell, right. Good, a good hand, does a great job. Over here, has anybody got a question over here? Frank Granger, I recognize you. Hey, get up, let's get a, there's a microphone, Frank. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for coming back to North Carolina today. We really appreciate you being here. A question that I have or that I'd like to get some explanation for is, as a kid when I was growing up, all of our uh, ditches and creeks and rivers were cleaned out. They, the water flowed through when we had the big rains. Today, these rivers and creeks and ditches are filled up with limbs and trees and everything else. And when we have the big rains, we have floods. And so somehow or another, we need to get back to some kind of program 
to get these ditches and rivers and streams cleaned out again. And I think we used prisoners when I was a kid growing up. They kept them clean during the summer. I was going to ask you, what was the program when you were a child to clean them out? Prisoners. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, again, uh, this gentleman up here has talked about RCS over, uh, certainly after uh, violent uh, uh, water events and things like that, there's a lot of debris, a lot of trees, and uh, a lot of programs to do that. We, uh, we put out a lot of money for communities over uh, restoring streamland thing, but it's really all of our issues and uh, both our soil conservation districts as well as the, they're kind of the boots on the ground on that. And uh, we get this NRCS issue resolved with uh, the relationship there, then maybe we can, can do more of that work. Next, next question, uh, gentlemen right here. Then I'll get Benji, Benji, you'll be, you'll be next. Benji Ford. Mr. Secretary, welcome to North Carolina. It's a, look, we've had a whole lot of concerns. I just want to say one thing about what the president has done with regulations, the way he's uh, rolled a lot of them back. I just want you to give him our thanks and our gratitude for what he's doing. I know that the labor situation, I'm glad the guy uh, brought that up and you finally addressed my issue with it because I need full-time labor. I don't need seasonal labor. And the H-2A uh, just does not work for us. But do uh, tell the president that we appreciate all that he's done in the regulation field. I guess the way the waters of the U.S. was proposed uh, previously, uh, everybody could clean out those things because it'd be belong to the government, right? All the waters would. Benji Farsh. Mr. Secretary, we really do appreciate you being in North Carolina today and for all the wonderful things that you and your department are doing for agriculture in North Carolina and across the nation. I do have one uh, thing I want to say and then a question I would like to ask if that would be appropriate. First of all, I want to thank the Trump administration for re the reauthorization of the Perkins in Perkins 5. Which, pro which provides a lot of resources for our public schools, private and uh, parochial type schools to pro provide agricultural education and FFA in the school systems and to expand it. And in doing that, one of the things that uh, we uh, here at the University of Mount Olive and across the, the state in trying to expand agricultural education and FFA opportunities to those young people is a goal of ours is to put FFA and ag education in every, in every high school in the state. And one of the limiting factors to that historically has always been the United States Department of Labor Statistics, which only clumps agriculture into active farmers, ranchers, and miners. And I've, I've spoken to Ray Starling about this, our commissioner, Commissioner Trotzler and his office does a tremendous job in providing uh, the expertise in promoting that agriculture is the number one industry in this state. But it would be very, very uh, uh, nice if the, the United States Department of Agriculture could promote on a national basis, first of all, how important that the labor market is in agriculture and that if you included all of the related agricultural industry and business that it would be the number one provider of jobs in the country and so i would love to see something done to make sure that there is a, a better relationship provided so that that could be started between the, the united states department of agriculture and the u.s department of labor and statistics thank you benji well, I would hope that we have been promoting agricultural jobs, and we've been working with the Department of Labor. Christy Boswell spends probably half of her time uh, on the phone or in emails with the Department of Labor on this H-2A issue, as well as the adverse wage rate and the things that you mentioned as well. Who's got a question? Uh, lady, lady in the back right here. Thank you, I have rather short arms. Um, well, thank you, uh, Secretary Perdue, for making the comment that when it comes to the Farm Bill, it's like a six-lane highway 
after you have the bill and that rulemaking, implementation, and appropriations are some larger process. My point is around, and I believe it's a sea change at USDA, is the work on heirs' property. As you know, coming from the state of Georgia, that's a problem with uh, African American and other minority farmers. So my question is, there is some language in the Farm Bill around uh, w the USDA working with community financial institutions. And I was wondering what that might look like if during the uh, time when your teams were meeting, had you looked at that in terms of actually how you would implement that provision? Um, FSA, as you know, does have relationships with some community development financial institution. So there's some rich history there, and I'm not sure if there's some new thinking about how that might look like. Thank you, ma'am. I'm sorry that I can't answer specifically your question. I know that the Farm Bill had uh, uh, more revenue and uh, help for our HBCUs as far as education goes. Uh, I'll have to look at that particularly. If you'll give us uh, uh, some of our team your name and uh, contact information, we will, uh, uh, when we get to that point, we will do that. I, I'm just not personally knowledge, knowledgeable about that uh, big thick book of all the farm, all farm programs there right now. Well, uh, thank you. And there are a few of us would like to, you know, get an audience with your team to look at that provision. Thank Surely. you. Who's got a question? Lady, lady, uh, lady in the back. Chair, Rachel is chair of the Young Farmer and Rancher Committee here at uh, University of Mount Olive. Rachel. Thank you, Secretary Purdue, for being here. Uh, my question for you is, hold on one second for me. What does the outlook on dairy, specifically cheese trade, um, with Mexico look like in the upcoming months? And what is the timeline for those tariffs to come off of that, specifically with that relationship? It's a good question. With the USMCA agreement, unfortunately, the steel and aluminum tariffs remained, and that's something we're working on right now, really with the president and uh, Ambassador Lighthizer to understand that these, uh, they call them 232 tariffs, they're retaliatory tariffs, uh, uh, need to be removed to have uh, totally tariff-free trade, just like the USMCA agreement does. The cheese, uh, uh, one problem with Mexico is that they allow the Europeans to come down and uh, talk them in the geographical indicators where you can't call uh, certain mozzarella or different types of cheeses like that. Europe's trying to claim uh, almost a name trademark patent on those names, so there'll be some difficulty there. But uh, Mexico's a huge, uh, uh, a huge export mar market for our cheese. I'm hopeful we can get these uh, uh, 232 tariffs from Mexico and Canada off very soon, so we can resume uh, that trade. It's important. Gerald Balance. Unless I'm hollering at somebody. <laughs> I want to th I want to thank that's pretty good. Now. I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank you, Mr. Purdue. I want to thank the state legislature that little bit of help we've got this week or last two weeks been good. And Mr. Trotz for, for standing up us standing up for us all, and uh, Larry for all he does for us. But one thing American agriculture has always had and its favor is its liability. And peace helps us at that. Now that liability has been hurt because of the grounds of trade disputes. We lost the exports during the embargo in the 80s and they were hard to come back. And now how long would you think it would take to, for us to get the trade back where it was when this, if it would end today? Did, I, I didn't quite understand the liability. Re reliability. Real liability. Real liability. Okay. I don't uh, speak plainly either. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> Reli uh, is that talking about reliable trading sure. partners and how what it takes? Part of what the Chinese are talking about right now, and they've already put on the table, we've talking, we're talking about specific amounts regarding Chinese. But, you know, my question is, did we, uh, did China become dependent on us for supply or did we become dependent on them as customers? What we're trying to do is go around the world and, and spread the uh, blessings around in that way. Uh, 
and they will. Some uh, I, I, of I us will uh, did rely on that 85 million pounds. Uh, I'm not sure. Would you say that again, sir? I, I'm not sure I understood. We did. Re I think he's saying, Gerald, you did say we did rely on, on that 85 million pounds. Out now that on we're losing farmers now. because of the yeah, tobacco tariff. Sure. Right. Tobacco. They were that close going, some were that close going, and they're gone now. Uh, again, with China. Lost the farmers. Daryl, we got you. we got your point. Jerome Vic, we got time for a couple more questions, and I'm going to ask the Commissioner of Agriculture to come up and make some comments. Certainly, we're not going to leave here. Uh, Jer uh, Jerome Vic, you got thank, the floor. Thank you, thank you, Larry. I've sat on my hands as long as I can. Uh, I want to thank the Secretary for coming down here and taking the time to see what kind of shape we're really in and the message I'd like for him to take back to Washington is critical down here. It's the most critical time I've seen in agriculture in the, all the time that I've been farming. Uh, and I started farming in 1975, 43 crops ago, and I've seen good ones and I've seen bad ones. After the embargo in the 80s, when times got so bad, I asked my wife one day if I went broke farming, was she going to still love me? And she said, yeah, and I'm going to miss you too. <laughs> so, the, the, the message I like for you to take back to Washington, the reason we all came here today is we all hanging around the mailbox every day. And a disaster check that Steve Trucks were when it went out on a limb to help us with, is really good, but it's gonna take more than that. These disaster funds are gonna be critical to keep us in business. And uh, just take the message back. This is not just a bump in the road, Eastern North Carolina, the, the house is on fire. Thank you, Jerome Vick. Got a question, uh, Mark Wellens. Last question, and if you got a, if you got a question didn't get answered, obviously the, the secretary's folks are around yes, here. We can get we can get a question to him. Mark Wellens from Johnston County. Thank you, Secretary Purdue. I'm Mark Wellens from Johnston County. I grow tobacco, soybeans, and vegetables. I want to thank you for the market facilitation payments. Some people refer to it as sunny money. That was greatly needed and appreciated. But the tariffs have just ruined the tobacco business. And that's what Gerald was trying to say, is we're in a world of hurt, and there's no, no help for us. And there's, there's, a sale, there's so many sales now, they can't just have them on Saturday, they gotta have them through the week. So if you can do anything to help us, I'd appreciate it. And I got one more point, and that was, this H2A adversary rage rate. I've been using, this will be my 22nd crop with H2A labor. And the wage rate is $5 an hour higher than the minimum wage. And it's not sustainable. Uh, the NCDA had an a ad hiring graders paying less per hour than the boys picking the vegetables make. I mean, there's gotta, we got to have some relief. And I don't know what the problem is on the West Coast, why the Western growers are bucking us so hard on it. But um, it's like Mr. Kendall said, Things are either going to get better or we're going to import the food because I'd be daggum if we can keep making it like we're making it now. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark Williams. Okay, 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 ladies and gentlemen, we could, uh, we could stay here with the secretary till 6 or 7 o'clock. He's, uh, he's got to get back to Washington. He's driving back, I think. Is that some, he's driving, getting back. We, he's had a busy day here. Uh, he's been on a hog operation day. He's been down at Butterball Turkeys. The commissioner's been with him. Uh, it's been a busy day and a good day for the secretary here in North Carolina. With that, we're not going to adjourn this meeting without our commissioner of agriculture, Steve Trox, for coming forth. Commissioner.
floor is yours. Mr. Secretary, I, I really appreciate you being here today. And this is not his first trip. He has traveled with me uh, after Florence, looking at the aftermath of that. Uh, he's been down several times. I've been to his place. <clears throat> we are in crisis in agriculture in North Carolina. I don't know how bad it is across the rest of the country. We all know it. Uh, this disaster payment is a bridge. Uh, we're trying to get folks from this year to next year and work on these problems. It's only temporary, we know that, but uh, it's an amazing feat when the legislature appropriated the money unanimously, and we are working as hard as we can work to get this money out the door, but it's, it's not simple. Uh, it's a moving target. In fact, uh, we've just been told that there are two other counties in North Carolina that have received declarations, so we're going to do everything we do to get them in. But that'll be 72 counties in North Carolina with either a secretarial or presidential designation. That's how bad this disaster is, and we got to work our way out of it. Uh, but I do want you to understand that the problems we've got are monumental. Uh, I've never seen anything like it in my lifetime. I've heard it here today uh, from labor uh, to the aftermath of the, the hurricanes, low commodity prices, uh, trade, you name it. It's all hit us at one time. And then on top of that, the U.S. currency is so strong right now it makes it difficult to export these products around the world. And tobacco being one of the major products that we're trying to export. So it's a, it's a perfect storm. Uh, we're going to take one piece at a time, try to rectify it. But what we have here in North Carolina is we have partnerships between the Farm Bureau, the Commodity Groups, the Agribusiness Council. But I want to add in something. that His nickname to his grandchildren is Big Buddy. I feel like that we in agriculture have got a big buddy nationwide sitting in that seat. And I know he's going to do everything he can do to help us. The good thing is I've got access. Four of his undersecretaries were my colleagues at the national le leadership level. I've got their personal cell phone number. I can call him anytime that I need to talk to him. Ray Starling is, is right there as his chief of staff. So we've got the access to talk about how do we solve these problems. We've got to do it at the state level and certainly got to do it at the federal level. But it, we have started that process at the state level with this disaster program. Hopefully, we're going to have a federal disaster program that comes down the line to piggyback on top of that. And we're going to be looking at a fresh start. And tobacco is, there is no question that is the most problematic uh, that we, uh, crop that we have out there right now. And China pulling out of the market, crashed the market last year. And we certainly hope that they get back in that market. But I can tell you for the last two months, I have worked with Ted McKinney, who was his undersecretary, to get China to understand that, that we wanted them back in the market, but it's all, it's all tangled up in all of the trade stuff. So tobacco has been, the word has been said in Washington for the first time in a long time, Mr. Secretary. We certainly do appreciate that. And if we can get everything back in line, get tobacco back to where it needs to be, then we're going to have a new beginning. We've got new crops out there we're looking at. We have a strong animal industry in this state, even though some people think that agriculture is a nuisance. I cannot imagine anybody thinking that way. But the danger in all of this is that we have 1% of the population raising the products that are feeding the 99%, and part of the 99% are trying to destroy the people that are feeding them. Biting the hand that feeds you, I think, is the old saying. That's where we are. So, Mr. Secretary, thank you once again. I know you know you're welcome in North Carolina anytime you'd like to come down. Uh, if we can help you, please call on us, because I can guarantee you I'm going to be calling you for help. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Commissioner Johnson. As we, uh, as, we, as we wind this up, in addition to thanking the Secretary for being here, I want to thank the University of Mount Olive for hosting this. I particularly want to thank Peter Daniel and a member of the Farm Bureau staff for getting the word out. Yesterday, this time, I was getting back from Brazil. So a lot, I was in Brazil all last week. And the press asked me, uh, what was the takeaway that we got from Brazil? 
in, the, in, the, in addition to beautiful crops, great crops, ladies and gentlemen, there was a real excitement about agriculture. There's excitement about agriculture there for the young people. And we can get that swagger back, but we got to get through this. We got to get through it. We will get through it. We're tough and we'll make it. Thank all of you very much. Thank you, Sonny Perdue. Appreciate it. We'll talk to y'all later. Thank you very much.